Thank you very much. So as you can see, our title is The Recent Pre-Trib Rapture Findings in the Early Church. Now I should start with an introduction who I am. My name is Lee Brainerd. I am an independent researcher, prophecy teacher, and a pastor elder in a Brethren Assembly, a small one in Harvey, North Dakota. Now, the first thing I want to ask is a question. Why should we investigate and present pre-trib rapture passages in the early fathers? I mean, after all, we all know that we can't prove anything on the truth of the pre-tribulation rapture from the early fathers. The proof is in the Bible, and we've got a ton of proof in the Bible. We have the typologies in the Old Testament. We have, uh, in the New Testament, we have a number of uh, illustrations and examples of, of the rapture, and in Pauline epistles, we have, uh, of course, the mystery revealed, and in uh, the book of Revelation, we have the, the rapture actually presented to us along with uh, a churchless tribulation, and then the church coming down with uh, the Lord Jesus Christ at the second coming. Um, now, the, the real blessing of the early church fathers is that we have an apologetic approach here. That's the real value. It's apologetics. Just like we find creation apologetics is a tremendous blessing for evangelism, prophetic apologetic is a tremendous blessing for the gospel, so we find that the historical fact that the revelational truth of the pre-tribulation rapture had strong testimony in the early church, it answers the reproach that the pre-tribulation rapture is a recent teaching. So this raises the question, how did I find these passages? Well, I started uh, not even looking for pre-tribulation rapture passages in the early fathers. I I was actually doing research on the Greek word apostasia relative to the rapture question in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. While I was looking at an apostasia passage in Ephraim the Syrian, I stumbled across a rapture passage that I did not recognize from those 35 passages that Tommy mentioned just a minute ago. And I was stunned. I almost fell off my chair. That passage was, Blessed is he who unceasingly remembers the fear of Gehenna and hastens to sincerely repent, for he shall be delivered from the great tribulation. I just shocked. I, I went into my library. I pulled a few volumes off my shelf. I did some research on some papers that were uh, housed on the Pre-Trib Research Center website. I couldn't find this passage in any of the lists. So... What I did is I thought, well, wait a minute, maybe there's more of these passages in Ephraim the Syrian. So I went through, Ephraim the Syrian has 150 plus works in Greek that have never been translated into English. So I, I went through the titles, the list of titles, and I found about a half a dozen, maybe eight titles that were in Latin and I, that looked like they were prophecy titles, and I just started reading these from the first word to the last word. By the time I got done, I found about a half a dozen pre-tribulation rapture passages. I felt like I hit a gold mine. And uh, so then I took the rapture terms that I had found and the gathering terms that I had found and terms like the clouds, and I started searching those for the entire body of Ephraim the Syrian's works. Now, if you're interested where I was looking at these works, have you ever heard of the TLG website, the Thesaurus Linguae Graecae? It has a very expansive collection of Greek writings. In theory, it has everything from Homer all the way to the 11th or 12th century Byzantine Greek. So it has, well, 2,000 years, basically, of Greek. And... There's, that's where I'm searching. So I pull up Ephraim Assyrian, I type these terms in one at a time, and I went through every hit on every word. By the time I was done, I had found 10 crystal clear pre-tribulation rapture references that were unknown to the dispensational world. And I found 20 other rapture passages that were obviously rapture passages, had the rapture language, but they didn't have anything in the immediate context that said definitively this is a pre-tribulation rapture. Well, I was so excited about this, I ripped off letters to a number of places. 
Um, one of the people I ripped off letters to was uh, Prophecy Watchers. I sent a, a letter that was to Gary Stearman and Bob Ulrich. And uh, Bob passed it on to Mondo, and Mondo got a hold of me. And Mondo was all excited about this. He got on top of this, and he passed the information on to Tommy Ice. And lo and behold, I get a late invitation to come and share this invitation. So I'm very thankful to the brothers at Prophecy Watchers, and I'm very thankful to Tommy Ice. So that raises another question, and that question is, what kind of classes of church fathers have I searched, and am I currently searching, and do I plan to search? And this breaks down into three classes here. There's the first class is known premillennialists and pre-tribulationists like Irenaeus, Cyprian, and Chrysostom. The second class is the Eastern or Antiochian fathers like Ephraim of Syria, Theodore of Mopsuestia, uh, and the two Gregories. And the third class is provocative uh, millennialists who are not in lockstep with the orthodoxy like Eusebius and Origen. Now, that brings up the one last question before we get a little deeper into this, and that's, what kind of terms am I searching for? And what we have here, as you can see, I've got a pretty extensive list. This is not exhaustive, but this is the kind of stuff I'm looking for. And so if you're interested and you have access to TLG or something similar and you're interested in doing some research like this, there's, there's more than enough material there for a hundred scholars to go deep diving in and to do some research. I'm looking at Harpazo, which that's the classic rapture term, to seize or snatch, Apontesis, which is meeting, Analambano to take up, Paralambano to take, Perusia, which is the royal entrance, Sunago to gather, Anabino to ascend, Petami to fly. By the way, I don't think you maybe didn't realize, but we didn't originate the concept of all fly away, oh glory. They had that in the early church. Uh, and it was a very common theme, especially in Ephraim the Syrian. I, I'm looking at Nephili, clouds, Salpinx, the trumpet, Kibotan, the ark. And this is a very fascinating one that I'm find uh, in several instances. This is the ark in the sense of like Noah's ark. And they would talk about being gathered into the heavenly ark before the tribulation came upon the earth. Of course, then we have terms like Antichristos, Therion, the beast, Draco and the dragon, uh, aura, the hour, like in the hour of trial in Revelation 3.10. Pyrosmos, same thing. It comes out of Revelation 3.10, the hour of trial. Orge, wrath, thumos, anger, thlipsis, tribulation, tereo, keep, and sozo, save. Now, my recent discoveries, and Tommy doesn't even know about four of these. I just shared with him the ten. I have ten crystal clear pre-tribulation rapture passages I'm going to show you this morning that come out of Ephraim the Syrian. Uh, very fascinating passage I discovered in Irenaeus' Greek fragments. Uh, one of the well-known pre-trib rapture passages is uh, Irenaeus' Against Heresies 529.1. Well, I found the Greek fragment of this passage in the Greek at least in my estimation, is actually clearer than the Latin, so I think this is a, a gain for us in the pre-trib camp. And then in Eusebius, I'm going to show you several passages I found in the last few weeks that are extremely provocative, and I think that they deserve some uh, significant research from uh, the Greek scholars in the pre-trib camp that want to go deeper into this. And we're going to look at all 14 of these passages this morning. Very briefly before we start Ephraim the Syrian, you might wonder who is Ephraim the Syrian? Well, Ephraim the Syrian is also spelled Ephraim or Ephraim. He is born in 306 and died in 373. He was born in Nisibis and he lived in Edessa at the end of his life. He was one of the most important and prolific Syrian fathers in the fourth century. And he maintained a very distinct, very clear pre-tribulation rapture testimony. What's interesting about this man, a lot of people don't realize this, he wrote over three million lines of hymns and sermons and prose and doctrinal writings. His writings were primarily done in Syriac. They were translated into Greek, most of them during his life. And he had a reputation, according to the uh, Sodom and the church historian, that these uh, Greek translations were extremely accurate he was essentially the Spurgeon of his day. He was loved and read for centuries afterwards. 
and by the way, I'm not going to go into this, but there's a lot of information of this type which leads me to believe that this whole concept of a pseudo Ephraim is vastly overblown. It's very hard in my mind to, to conceive of how you could have a man that was as popular as Spurgeon, and within two centuries after his life, his real works are disappearing left and right, uh, and you get all these pseudo Ephraim stuff coming up. I'm very skeptical. I can't say that there isn't any such thing as, as pseudo Ephraim, uh, because the, the false writing is relatively common in the early church, but typically uh, when people would put forth a spurious work and they would put somebody else's name on it that was of someone a well-known, they were trying to uh, put out false doctrine into the church under that man's name. And when you look at the pseudo-Ephraim stuff and the recognize genuine Ephraim stuff. It's the same eschatology. It's the same gospel. It's the same rapture. It's the same concept of salvation. Waited a little bit over onto the performance-based side like a lot of the early church was. But it's, and the same turns of expression. So if you guys or anybody out there is interested in, in the early church fathers and the pre-tribulation rapture, I'd encourage you to put some time into Ephraim the Syrian I think we need a few men of academic weight looking into this question because I think that it's going to be to our advantage if we can defend uh, these pre-tribulation rapture passages out of Ephraim the Syrian as genuine Ephraim. But it's not actually a critical point because, you know what, if, if all those liberal scholars and the anti-premillennial scholars want to insist that these are actually pseudo-Ephraim from the 6th century, maybe as late as the 7th century, okay, we'll take it. If you've got a pre-tribulation rapture testimony this strong, this deep into the church history, that tells us that earlier in church history, the testimony of the pre-tribulation rapture was much broader, much deeper, and much stronger than we ever anticipated. So we're going to win either way. All right, well, let's go on to these passages. The first, this is the first one I found. Uh, this is the, the one I almost fell off my chair on. Blessed is he who unceasingly remembers the fear of Gehenna and hastens to sincerely repent, for he shall be delivered from the great tribulation. Now, this is technical language. Nobody can read this from the early church or read it from the Middle Ages or read it from our age and not connect this with Matthew 24 and the time of great tribulation in the Antichrist. I mean, you have to practice deceptive theology rather than perceptive theology to miss this one. This is in 55 Beatitudes. And for those of you that are interested, I've actually got the technical information on each of these in my hard notes. The hard notes are going to be available on the website in PDF, in Word document, and also my slides will be there. So if you want to dive in deeper, I've got the, um, the Latin title is available so you can find it. Uh, I've got the Roger Pierce numbers. I have the TLG numbers. They're not always the same. That's tragic, but it's the way it is. And I give you uh, links to the Roger Pierce site and links to the TLG site. Um, there is an expense if you want to use the TLG site. I don't remember what it is, but I think it's like $135 a year. But if you're doing research or you're a Greek scholar, it's worth every penny of it. The, the search tools there are insanely powerful. All right, well, my next slide is the second Ephraim, the Syrian quote. This one is found in Sermon on Repentance and Judgment in the Separation of the Soul from the Body. For the elect shall be gathered prior to the tribulation, so they shall not see the confusion and the great tribulation coming upon the unrighteous world. Uh, again, notice we got the term the Great Tribulation here. And it's very distinct, distinct, gathered before the Great Tribulation. I think it's amazing that he expected the rapture not immediately at the beginning of the Great Tribulation, but prior to the Great Tribulation. A concept that's actually uh, growing in its uh, understanding and conception in our day. Now, also notice the clarification. He's not saying 
that they're going to be protected during the tribulation. He's very clearly saying gathered prior to the tribulation so they will not see the great tribulation and so they will not see the confusion. Also, there's an interesting uh, note here. This word confusion, Ephraim the Syrian and so several of the other early fathers used the word confusion as a technical synonym for the time of tribulation. And this is the word that uh, was in the passage that Brother Grant Jeffrey brought out in the Latin. It used the term confusion. And this term you'll find a number of times in Ephraim the Syrian's writings. So let's move on to the third Ephraim the Syrian passage. This is from On the Second Coming of Our Lord Jesus Christ. The righteous shall be seized up in the clouds to meet him, while those who are lazy and timid like me shall remain on earth trembling. Now, this is interesting because here we do see a little bit of that leaning towards a performance-based understanding of the gospel. Uh, you just have to get over that if you're reading in the early church fathers. It was everywhere. Their understanding of the gospel wasn't as clear as our understanding of grace is today. Um, it, it's just the way it is. But this is crystal clear pre-tribulation rapture testimony. And notice the allusion to 1 Thessalonians 4, seized up in the clouds to meet him. I just find it fascinating to realize that, the, that our view of the blessed hope for the church that we have today, it did not begin like some people try and say back in 1830 by a, a prophecy given by a woman who got it from a deceiving spirit and J. N. Darby thought, oh, this is a cool idea, and he went and ran with it. No, this has been here like William uh, Watson has demonstrated. It was part of the, um, the Reformation testimony, and we've had it ever since. And it was part of the early church testimony, as many dear brothers have, have proven, and as these examples here prove, and the fact of the matter is, it was even during the Dark Ages. We don't have much from the Dark Ages because uh, all we have basically is the accusations of the Catholic Church that they were putting the Chileast heretics to death. That's about all we know about the, the Dark Ages. But there was a Chileast testimony in the early church. The Chileasm, if you're not familiar with that term, of course, it's the uh, Greek for a thousand years, so I'm just talking about the millennium. Also notice there's a little pseudo-humility here. Uh, Ephraim the Syrian was kind of an ascetic. He was in the monastery type circle. Uh, this early on they were often referred to as the ascetics. They hadn't really moved into the full-blown monastery concept, concept yet, but they were in the proto-stages of that. Well, those who are lazy and timid like me are going to remain on earth trembling. It's kind of a pseudo-humility that they had. And this is also very common, not merely in Ephraim the Syrian, but in a number of the other early fathers. Well, let's move on. We've got a number of these to work our way through. This is Ephraim the Syrian, uh, the fourth quote. And here we have a, a very amazing quote out of, On the fathers who have completed their course. Again, when we see the saints in glory flying off in light, in the clouds of the air, to meet Christ, the King of glory, but see ourselves in the great tribulation, who shall be able to bear that shame and reproach? I've often thought about that. I mean, I think about it in our situation. What are my unsaved family and friends going to think when they miss the rapture and they realize, wow, that nutcase was right? Well, they had the same concept going on in the early church. Wow, those nutcases were right. Well, God's got more than one way to preach the gospel. I'm telling you what, a lot of people are going to be wide awake and not in the woke awake state after the rapture. All right, now we move on to the, the fifth passage uh, this is out of Sermon on the Advent, the End, and the Coming of the Antichrist. By the way, I should, I should let you know, I, I didn't preface this yet, but if there's any mistakes in these translations of Latin titles, and if there's any mistakes in the translation of these Greek passages, you know who to blame. I can't pass the buck to anybody else. This is, this, all these translations are on me. I don't think I made any mistakes, but uh, sometimes that early patristic Greek can be a little bit rough, and so... 
If any of you Greek scholars out there notice something in here that you think I can improve, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, if I respond violently, I promise I'll only take one arm off. I, I don't usually take two. All right. The, uh, so we are on Ephraim the Syrian, quote number five. Watch always, praying continually, that you may be worthy to escape the tribulation. If anyone has tears and compunction, let him pray the Lord that he might be delivered from the tribulation which is about to come upon the earth, that he might not see it at all, nor the beast himself, nor even hear of its terrors. There's no way that this can be a deliverance through the time of tribulation. This is absolutely impossible. Now, of course, we see here again this performance-based concept praying continually that he might be worthy to escape the tribulation. Now, delivered from it and not see it at all. That's to me, is a very powerful pre-tribulation rapture testimony. Well, let's move on to Ephraim number six. Let us take up the full armor that we may be able to fight the good fight that we might be delivered from the wrath coming upon the sons of disobedience. This is in on patience and the consummation of this age and on the second coming. Here again, now we've, we've moved from passages that were talking about the great tribulation to passages that are talking about the wrath. As you start reading through these Ephraim Assyrian passages, you realize he didn't make one of these fastidious grade school level distinctions between the great tribulation and the wrath of God or between the tribulation and the wrath of God. There was none of this pre-wrath rapture type stuff. In his mind, the tribulation and the wrath and judgment were the same thing. He, he, he never even takes up the question that there might be a distinction. And by the way, this equating of these terms across the board, anywhere you go in the early church fathers, it is this way. There is no concept of, of uh, making a distinction between the church suffering under the Antichrist and then a short period of wrath. That, it does not exist. That's a, you know, these people that are throwing reproach on the pre-tribulation rapture camp, talking, oh, you guys got a new position. You're, you're, you're only since 1830. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, what a bunch of hypocrisy is going on here. Isn't your position since what, like 1988 or 1989 at the earliest? Anyway, my wife, when she watches, say, tone it down, honey, tone it down. Don't be so hard. All right, let's move on to uh, slide number 14, which is Ephraim's quote number seven. Count us worthy, Lord, of the rapture of the righteous when they meet you, the master, in the clouds, that we might be not be tried by the bitter in inexorable judgment. This is in Sermon on the Resurrection of the Dead. Now, this passage here is actually loaded with a lot of very interesting information for those that want to go into this pre-trib rapture in the early fathers on a technical level. Uh, first of all, the word rapture here, this is the Greek noun harpage, which is the noun of the verb harpazo. And also we have the word judgment here. Like I said, he's, he's using interchangeably back and forth, wrath, judgment, tribulation and even great tribulation. And I'm gonna give you a little rabbit trail here on great tribulation and tribulation in the early fathers. I wanna point out, because we understand in our day there's seven years of tribulation and only the last three and a half are called the great tribulation. But one of the difficulties you run into in reading the early church fathers is you might wonder why they're using great tribulation and tribulation like they're synonyms. Well, one of the difficulties that we run into is many of the early church fathers, if they weren't amillennial, they were influenced by amillennialism, and they didn't really understand a full seven years. They struggled with the concept, and they regularly were only talking about the last three and a half years. So if you're running into an early church passage and you're struggling with this, just consider that, that that might be a possibility in the passage that you're dealing with that they were only really talking about the last three and a half years. We have much more light, of course, in our day. We understand the seven 
this, the seven years. Uh, the, the farther, the deeper you get into early church history, the more they've lost this conception of the 70th week, and they're only dealing with the tribulation on the, ba on the basis of about a third of the passages that we would use. Now, another one I want to point out in this passage here is that we have the verb tried, and this is the, the verb pyrazo, which I think the allusion here is to Revelation 3.10, where we have the noun pyrosmos, which is trial. So that we have tried by the bitter and inexorable judgment. In Revelation, we have the hour of trial, which comes upon the whole world. And I, again, I want to emphasize, this passage here, there's no way you can read into this passage that he was talking about a deliverance through the time of tribulation. It's, it's not even remotely possible. What he's talking about is that you are not even going to be tried by that bitter and inexorable judgment. There's no conception here that you're going to pass the trial. You won't be here for the trial. Now, let me take a little rabbit trail here. Because uh, this is a good spot to do this. A lot of people want to accuse pre-tribulationism of being mere escapism. We, we can't face the probability or the reality that we might be going into a time of tribulation at the end of the church age. And we're just going to bury our head in the sand and do the little escapist thing like the ostrich, right? Well, there's no escapism -ism -ism here. None at all. It's been given unto the church to suffer tribulation, to enter the kingdom through much tribulation. We've had 2,000 years of tribulation. And if you want to point to our experience here in America, this is really an anomaly in church history. What we have had here has been seen only in minute traces here and there in the history of the world. And the fact of the matter is, I think the saints in places like Australia and Canada and Europe are starting to see tribulation on the basis of their Christian testimony, and it might be coming here. There's no guarantee we're going to escape this. But this is an escapism. What the Lord is doing with the pre-tribulation rapture is saying, okay, church, your 2,000 years of being tried by fire is over. I'm done with what I'm doing with you, and now I'm going to move on, and I'm going to bring the new covenant to the Jewish people, to the people of Israel. I'm going to give them their second chance. He's going to pick up right where he left off at the end of the 69th week in the cross. And he's going to take up with the people under the law, return to them as people under the law, and try and present to them the glories and beauties and the Messiah of the new covenant. There's no escapism here. The Lord's just moving from the church to Israel. We got done with our trials. Now it's their turn. At any rate, Let's move on to Ephraim quote number eight. This one here is from the destruction of pride. Take us away from the coming fear and count us worthy of that rapture, that snatching away, when the righteous are raptured or snatched in the clouds to the air to meet the king of glory. Now, this is an interesting one here too, because you have this interesting phrase, take us away from the coming fear. Now, he's used, the Greek often uses the word fear in a way that's unfamiliar to us. Um, we use fear in, in the sense of feelings that we have. They often use the, the word fear in the sense of something that's on the horizon and heading toward you and that's giving you fear. So if, if this doesn't make clear English to you, just substitute the word uh, horrors or terrors. Take us away from the coming horrors or the coming terrors and count us worthy of that snatching away. Again, we see the noun rapture and we see the verb harpazo. And we also find the noun apontesis, which we find in 1 Thessalonians 4.17. That's the meeting in the air. So his, his rapture passages and there are continually alluding to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 to Luke 21 and passages like that. Well, let's move on to Ephraim quote number 9. And this is from How the Soul Ought to Pray God with Tears. Blessed are those who cry day and night that they should be delivered from the coming wrath. Now I'm going to immediately go on to verse, or to the, not verse 10, but the 10th, whoops, the 10th one. Should be, oops. 
Yep, here we are. This is the 10th one. This is slide 17. I accidentally bumped it two slides. And this one here is almost identical. The Latin title is on the blessed and the cursed. It's blessed are those who cry day and night because they shall be delivered from the coming wrath. Now, I've got an interesting thought here, and this is just for you Greek mavens who love to spend time in Greek. But the only difference between these two passages is the first one had the promise in the aorist subjunctive, and this one has it in the future indicative. Now, it probably goes over the head of a lot of people, but it's just saying, in a nutshell, that the promise that they should be delivered from the coming wrath and the promise they shall be delivered from the coming wrath are saying essentially the same thing. They're just approaching it from a different angle or a different nuance. So let's look at some observations on Ephraim's rapture position. First of all, I want to point out that he uses phrases like great tribulation, tribulation, wrath, judgment, and confusion as synonyms. He's got no quibbling distinction between the tribulation and the wrath. I also want you to notice that in some of these passages, he has false Christians left behind at the rapture. Now, we might draw the line at what a false believer is a little differently than he does, and I'm sure that God draws that line differently than all of us do. But the fact of the matter is, that concept is there. He recognized the fact that when that rapture trumpet blows, there are people that are going to find themselves surprised that they didn't go up. That was one of the things I really loved about Tim LaHaye's Left Behind series, is that he brought that out. A lot of people were offended by that. Um, I personally wasn't. I think that a lot of people are going to face that unpleasant surprise. Now, he also used a lot of different terms for the rapture. Gather, fly, seize, deliver, remove, meet in the clouds. I could go on and on. So trying to make a case on the, uh, that Ephraim taught a pre-tribulation rapture, we're not trying to hang it on one technical term that we've got to make a technical argument that we've technically understood this in a correct way. This is plain language, and it's angled from about a half a dozen different angles. He also uses the prepositions ek, which is out of, and apo, which is from, over and over again when he's talking about exclusion from the judgment, exclusion from the wrath, exclusion from the time of confusion. And lastly, he expected the rapture prior to, not immediately at, but prior to the beginning of the tribulation. Now, also I want to point out the similarities and the comparisons between the passage that Grant Jeffrey found in uh, the Latin work of Ephraim the Syrian and what I've been observing here in the Greek works of Ephraim the Syrian. Now, the, the work that uh, Grant uh, was pr presented to the public back in, I believe it was 1994, was on the last times, the Antichrist, the end of the world. And what I've observed between that Latin work, reading it in the English translation, uh, and then looking at the Ephraim, the Syrian, in the Greek, they both have the same terms and the same eschatology. They both have a three and a half year great tribulation with a literal antichrist. They both use the term confusion as a term for the tribulation. They both use the term dragon as a title both for the Antichrist and Satan. Uh, apparently, as I'm reading through Ephraim the Syrian, I, I realize that they saw a very close connection between the devil and the Antichrist. The, the, the Antichrist is essentially Satan manifest in flesh. That's how they were perceiving it. And so they had no problem addressing the Antichrist as the dragon as well as uh, Satan as the dragon. Both of them understood the tribulation wasn't merely persecution upon the church, but persecution on saints in general and judgment on the world. They both had plagues, famines, droughts, and earthquakes in the tribulation, and they both had Elijah and Enoch returning in the tribulation to preach the gospel. And they had the church returning with Christ at the second coming. 
So in my mind, as I mentioned earlier, I think if, if uh, some uh, learned academic types put a lot of time into Ephraim the Syrian, I think it would be relatively easy to prove that the vast majority of these so-called pseudo-Ephraim stuff is the same as the Ephraim in the Syriac that's recognized as the real Ephraim. So let's move on to Irenaeus. I've only got one slide here but on Irenaeus's works, but he was born around 130 A.D., died around 202 A.D. He was born in Smyrna, which is modern Izmir, Turkey. He was a bishop of Lugdunum, which is modern Lyon, France. He was both premillennial and pre-tribulational. He knew Polycarp, and Polycarp was a disciple of John. His premier work was Against Heresies, which was a crushing work against Gnosticism. Sadly, most of his works have not survived, uh, except in fragments, because starting from his era and moving forward, the Chiliast works are the works of those that believed in a literal, a millennial kingdom, a literal thousand years. They were suppressed by the folks who followed in the footsteps of Origen with his allegorizing and Augustine with his replacement theology. And uh, except for pieces that were uh, squirreled away in, in uh, the distant monastery type locations, they were suppressed. So I'd mentioned earlier that the Greek, in my estimation, is stronger than the Latin in this passage, 529.1. And I present up here, uh, when in the end the, uh, the church shall be suddenly caught up, from this it is said there shall be tribulation. And that's out of the Latin translation. And you'll notice that I have up there that in the Latin we have cum, which is when, and a sumatur, which is shall be caught up. In the Greek, this whole thing is expressed simply by the present passive participle analambanomenes, being caught up. So the Latin has when with the regular verb, and the Greek has a participial phrase being caught up. Now, here I give this in the Greek. You can see that I've got the analambanomenes being caught up in orange, and I have the thlipsis tribulation in orange breaking this up so that we have the, the church in the white and we have there shall be in the white letters. Now, I said that analambanomenes here is a present passive participle being caught up. It's a circumstantial participle which contextualizes there shall be tribulation. I think it's important to point out that this participle is present tense. The main verb is future tense. When you have this kind of a situation, uh, we're not obligated to the position where you take the present tense and you say it has to be happening at the exact same time as, as the main verb. That doesn't always work that way, and in this circumstance, I believe it certainly doesn't. This is giving us the circumstance. This, is gonna, this will be true, and then this shall happen. So instead of a more ambiguous when this happens, this is going to happen, we have the fact it's going along the, the lines of once this happens or this being true, this shall happen. So I think that what it's saying here is when it's, when the, it's true, when it's a, a, a happening fact, when it's a finished fact that the church has been gathered or caught up, then there shall be tribulation. So I'm just putting this out there for those of you that are uh, more studious in the Greek. Take and investigate this and let me know what you think. All right, let's move on to Eusebius. And here we have some interesting facts. Eusebius was born somewhere around 260 to 265, died around 339 to 340. He was the bishop of Caesarea by the sea, a very learned, very influential scholar. His best known work is his ecclesiastical history. In fact, there's not much of Eusebius that is translated except for his ecclesiastical history. He was suspected of Arianism. There's probably a little truth in that. And he was obviously influenced by Origen. He was very much himself uh, an allegorizing interpreter. And he enjoyed the favor of Constantine. And he used the allegorical method. And as best as I can tell, he was apparently an amillennialist. I found nothing in his writings that would include me to believe that he was a premillennialist. But what I find very fascinating here 
uh, I found passages, and I'm going to show them to you, that I think that he was definitely a pre-tribulationist. And the more I looked at the writings of some of the other early church fathers, I realized, in our mind, we think of, well, if they're amillennial, they're probably uh, anti-pre-tribulational. But what I've discovered is some of these early fathers, they were treating the millennium issue like a different issue than a literal tribulation at the end of the age. And so they were obviously rejecting a literal thousand-year kingdom, but they were embracing a pre-tribulation rapture. So this is food for thought for you, there, anybody out there that studies in the early church fathers, to investigate this and to look deeper into this. So let's move on to the first Ephraim of Syrian passage I have. This is in his fragments in Daniel, fragment Epsilon. The Apostle Paul was moved to write in this manner on the second coming of Christ, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the command, with the call of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and so forth. But the same Apostle also set forth an order in his prophetic writings, the ultimate coming of the Antichrist and his depravity, and after this, the glorious appearing of our Savior. Now, notice that Paul set these things in order. The rapture, the Antichrist, and the glorious appearance. And notice that the ultimate coming of the Antichrist appears in this context to follow the rapture. He sets forth the rapture. He says he also sets forth the ultimate coming of the Antichrist, and then the end game is the destruction of the mystery of iniquity. After this, the glorious appearing of the Savior. I've got some more technical notes. For those of you who want to go deeper into this, I have technical notes on this passage in the hard notes that's in, as I said, PDF in the Word doc. Well, let's move on to a second one. Commentary on Psalms, number 75. Then they shall be exalted when they shall reign with their own king, according to the apostle who said, For the firstfruits is Christ, then those who are Christ in his parousia, then the end, when he shall deliver the kingdom to his God and Father, when he shall deliver or destroy all authority and power. Now what's fascinating about this, those of us that are premillennial, we look at this passage and we see Christ the firstfruits, being raised from the dead nearly 2,000 years ago. Then we have those that are Christ at his coming, which is a reference to the rapture. And the end, we put at the end of the millennium. But if you're a millennial, you don't have a, a, at the end of the millennium to put that at. That has to be backed up, retreated to the second coming. Well, as soon as your theology puts this at the second coming, we got some very interesting math going on here in the early church. Because if you have taking Paul's passage here literally, and you say, Paul's passage literally plus amillennialism equals what? Pre-tribulationism. You have to have a rapture prior to the end. Now, it doesn't tell us how much time he's going to put between those. But he made here a clear temporal distinction between the end at the second coming and the gathering of those who belong to Christ at his parousia. The last one is fragments in Luke. Uh, chapter 17. I was really amazed how often I found the uh, early church fathers using uh, rapture passages in the Gospels, the same ones that are commonly used uh, today as rapture passages for very similar reasons. And here in this passage we read, As all perished then except those gathered with Noah in the ark, so also had his coming, the ungodly in the season of apostasy shall perish, while, according to the pattern of Noah, all the righteous and godly are to be separated from the ungodly and gathered into the heavenly ark of God. For in this way comes the time when not even one righteous man will be found any more among mankind, and when all the ungodly have been made atheists by the Antichrist and the whole world is overcome by apostasy, the wrath of God shall come upon the ungodly." I just, I thought, I was just flabbergasted by this passage. They're gathered into the heavenly ark. Not one righteous man is left on the face of the earth. We go into a season of apostasy when the whole world is conformed to the image of the Antichrist rather than the image of Christ. 
and then the end comes with the final judgment of God. So there's some insight I'd like to point to here on patristic amillennialism. As I mentioned earlier in our day, amillennialism and the rejection of the pre-tribulation rapture go hand in hand. It seems to me that in the early church, these were not necessarily viewed in the same school of thought. They often treated the tribulation and the thousand years as two different issues. Eusebius was amillennial, yet he appears to hold a pre-tribulation rapture. And so far, um, well, I'd just like to put this out there for scholars to go deeper investigation in this. I think it deserves more research. Uh, I think that there's a lot that could be discerned out of this on the relationship between amillennialism and pre-tribulationism in the early church. I think we need to do more digging on this issue. So in conclusion, what I... When I conclude from these passages that I have uncovered, I think there is a, a much larger body of evidence for the pre-tribulation rapture in the early church than many of us had anticipated. I know that I'm shocked by how much I'm finding. Uh, a number of men have expressed to me that they're shocked by what we're finding. And I'm, I want to point out, I haven't exhausted Ephraim the Syrian yet. I haven't exhausted Eusebius yet. There's a number of these early fathers who have Greek works not translated into English. I haven't even touched them yet. And you know what, to be honest, I wouldn't shed one tear if 10 or 20 men started throwing their time and energy into some of this research and, and uh, they end up taking up the ball and outstripping my research. I could care less. I just want this truth into the hands of the dispensational believing believers who are looking forward to the soon coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a fascinating subject. And I, I sus oh, go <laughs> ahead. I think these passages suggest that the pre-tribulation rapture was much broader and deeper in the early church than, than we'd anticipated. Um, I think that there's a lot of information in Ephraim and Eusebius here that's going to help us to frame a much clearer understanding of the pre-tribulation rapture theology in the early church. They didn't necessarily frame things exactly like we do, but they had rock solid, rock of Gibraltar solid convictions on the matter. And uh, I also want to point out, I think these works suggest that the eschatology of Ephraim that's preserved in the known Latin work is not a fluke. It's not a fluke. I think if we put more time into the Greek works and put time into the Syriac works, I think we're going to find that these things are by and large in lockstep with each other and that we're going to start adding a body of information from other fathers in the same time and it's going to I think we're going to be amazed by what we find. So, in conclusion, I always like to end as a preacher because I'm, I'm a preacher first and a teacher second. We got one short life to be a good soldier. And we got one long eternity to be a fulfilled human being. And I just want to encourage you all, just no matter what your gift is, no matter what your calling is, no matter whether you're on the academic side, no matter whether you're just helping out at conferences, working in the kitchen, I don't care what your gift and call is, just be diligent and faithful as a good soldier until the Lord returns and calls us home. You know what? Endure your hardship and do exploits for him. It's going to be worth it all. Amen. Thank you, Lee. Yeah. Now we're ready to question you. Yeah, questioning's fine. Being grilled is not so much. Okay, go, <clears throat> go ahead. Okay, uh, maybe it's too early, but have you had any rebuttals from people like, you know, Marv Rosenthal or uh, Joe Schimmel or anybody who's tried to put down what you're doing or... or, or uh, Gary DeMar, like that. Yeah. Well, so far I've been... So far I've been flying under the radar. That's probably not going to stay that way for long, but... Uh, I, I know a few men that can come to my defense if I start getting beat to death. Tom, Tom who is the guy that you most recently debated on the uh, pre-wrath view versus the... Oh, goodness, I can't think of his name. Starts with, last name starts with S, I think. 
Yeah, uh, yeah, he's a premillennialist, but goodness. My pastor said Southwest Radio Church sponsored that debate, and then I <clears throat> get there and found out they were opposed to my view, but nevertheless. <laughs> well, Tim, my, my pastor, Tim Burns, said that uh, this guy, in his view, is kind of like the leading pre, uh, mid-tribber or, or pre-rather, and he wanted to get a, um, a copy of that debate, so I need to get with you on that. Well, no, I didn't you even need know to, the guy's you, name. I hadn't you heard. You need to deal with Southwest Radio Church. I don't. I don't know if I have a copy. All right. Well, uh, praise the Lord. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I, I did see your video on YouTube with Mondo and was all just as excited as you were. And I had it in my mind that I was going to come here and ask Tommy if he was familiar. And, and of course, Tommy's way ahead of me. Um, but I do have uh, another question on your vocabulary list, your search terms. Yeah, yeah. You, you said was not exhaustive, and, and yeah. a, wor a word I didn't see on the slide was episunagoge from... Uh, yeah, it's a similar to a sunago, yeah, and that is, that is used too, yes. Well, so I was going to ask how prevalent that was, because in Second Thessalonians 2, with regard to the parousia, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and our episunagoge, yeah. our gathering together to Him. Yep. The only other place that's found in the New Testament is Hebrews 10.25. And I know that's a favorite text for pastors, and we preach, you know, quit skipping church. Um, but the episunagoge is the same term that's a rapture reference in 2 Thessalonians 2. And so I've wondered if in Hebrews 10, when it says not neglecting rapture doctrine, as is the habit of some, but all the more as you see encouraging one another, all the more as you see the day drawing near. Yeah, no, b to be honest, I had never heard of or thought of the rapture understanding that passage in Hebrew, but I'll definitely put it on the back burner and let it simmer for a while and see what happens. And, and that would weigh more in my mind. I, I would want to evaluate that more rather than just two instances in the New Testament. Right. But if you, if you discover that it's used very commonly uh, for Ephraim or any of these other authors as a, as a rapture term, I'd be curious to see those results. Yeah, one of the things I plan on doing, and I wished I had about 10 times more hours in a day than I have, but I'd like to put up on my website a list by Greek words of all the rapture passages I find by those words in the early fathers. Put that on my website. Thank you. You bet. Lee, this is the last presentation, and it seems to me, after all these years, that there just aren't as many questions. Seems that like people want to get out of here. Yep. Uh, but go ahead. Will you go? Will you put slide 22 up? Can you still do that? What's that? Slide 22. Slide 22. And there we are. <clears throat> okay. Ana Lombana Menes. Yeah. Um, and is this the one that has the Latin? Yes, it is the Latin. Yeah, yeah, right. The ambiguous when. Yeah. The, there, yeah, that's what. I'm, that's the one. The, the next one. I'm sorry. Twenty one. That's right. So the Latin translates cum for when. I don't know Latin. I know a little bit of Greek. Yep. Um, it seems like the 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 Latin is trying to do a, a commentary, if you will. They're saying the circumstantial participle is temporal. So they use cum and so yep, yep. for when. Yep. Is there another alternative, or are you taking it as a when, um, a temporal? Because well, in my little bitty Greek that I know, yep. adverbial participles have these, these various possible functions, and right. often, often there will be temporal, but there might be something else. Is right. there another way to do that than, than temporal? That well, you, it would, depending on the p context, you can use the uh, participles for virtually anything you please to use them for that, that Greek would allow you to use them right, for. Right, so you got means and result and, yep, and yep. purpose and all those things, yep. or concession, but, but it seems to be temporal there. It does, it absolutely does, so that's the why the Latin translated it the way it did. So yeah. the Latin commentary, yep. I think is very helpful that they're saying it's a, we're old, we're, we're very ancient, we know Greek better than, than I probably ever will, and we're saying it's temporal. Absolutely, so that, would that be... is definitely a benefit that the Latin brings. You put this Latin and the Greek together, and I think it's, it's a pretty good, strong slam dunk. Yeah. Right, right, okay, thank you. Yep. <clears throat> I 
Lee, do you know where Cain got his wife? Cain got his wife? Yeah. Didn't he go to the local uh, uh, Russian mail order bride store? I don't know. I was just wondering. Oh. <laughs> any other questions or comments? Do you have any other comments? No. no. Well, uh, don't forget to turn in your name tags uh, as you leave. And David, would you lead us in closing prayer? One other quick announcement. We're not going to be having the DVDs this year. We're going to be putting the videos up on YouTube when we get them produced and everything. So just look towards our YouTube channel. It's called the Pre-Church Study Group, and you go on there. So we'll get them up as fast as we can. And I do just want to thank uh, Frank and everybody from his church. They do a great job bringing all this stuff in. So let's thank them. They do all this for free, so we really appreciate that, and we can go back over the years and look at all this, so thank you all. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for just the last two and a half days, three days we've all been together. We thank you that we can come together with just elder believers that look towards your coming. It is such a precious truth that we don't find our ultimate hope in this world, in the circumstances of this world, but we find our hope in Jesus Christ. Lord, we do pray that you will be taking this information back to where we're at and all the things we've learned, and we can just, with a new restored vigor and vitality, share it with people and point them ultimately to Christ. Lord, we do just pray for our country. We pray for just our world, Lord. Help them to just to repent, to turn from their sin and put their faith in Jesus Christ. And we most of all hope that your coming is very soon so that we can be with you. We just commit these days to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.